King Charles III was officially crowned on May 6, 2023, the first coronation the UK has seen in 70 years. The spectacle gave viewers plenty of memorable moments, some awe-inspiring, others a bit embarrassing. The drama began before the king was even on the scene, with the arrival of Prince Harry. Given everything that's happened between him and the Sussexes in recent years, there was plenty of speculation as to whether or not Harry would even show up for the event. In the end, the Duke of Sussex did decide to attend. The prince arrived alone to little fanfare, and without Meghan Markle, who reportedly stayed behind in California to celebrate Prince Archie's birthday. Harry wasn't in the royal robes that many of his relatives wore, nor did he don a military uniform like Princess Anne. Instead, he wore a simple suit designed by Dior, blending in with all of the other non-royal guests. Far from his estranged brother who sat in the front, Harry took a seat in the third row, where he chatted with his cousins and participated in the ceremony. He left quite quickly when it was over, reportedly going to Heathrow Airport to fly back home, forgoing an opportunity to appear on the balcony with his family or attend the following day's coronation concert, the BBC reports. Harry seemingly had very little interaction with his immediate family members. Insider reports he and William ignored each other all day, not even sharing a simple hello or glance of acknowledgement. There's also no indication that he had a private moment with his father either, though what happened behind closed doors is obviously unknown. In the run-up to the coronation, there was plenty of chatter about who did and didn't get an invite. For starters, King Charles's younger brother, Prince Andrew, was included among the attendees. Due to his association with convicted sex offender Jeffrey Epstein, Andrew stepped back from public duties in 2019. But that didn't keep him from showing up on the big day wearing ceremonial robes. He had no formal role in the ceremonies, but his mere presence was enough to frustrate onlookers who booed him upon his arrival at the church. Andrew's ex-wife, Sarah Ferguson, was not one of the 2,200-plus attendees. During an appearance on Loose Women, she acknowledged that her divorce from the prince likely excluded her from the guest list. You can't have it both ways. You can't be divorced and then say, I want this. You've got to hold You're in line. or you're out. Right. She said she planned to enjoy a tea party while watching the proceedings on television. Many felt that her long-standing relationship with the royal family should have been enough to grant her a seat in the Abbey, but it didn't. And then there were the grandchildren. Of course, Prince George was one of King Charles's pages. However, many commentators criticized Queen Camilla's grandchildren being given official roles in the ceremony, as it marked a break in tradition. Their outrage only grew when it was revealed that two of King Charles's grandchildren, Prince Archie and Princess Lilibet, weren't even invited. Guests in attendance included foreign royals and dignitaries, celebrities, and ordinary citizens who were lucky enough to nab tickets. Among these folks were Dames Emma Thompson and Maggie Smith, First Lady Jill Biden, British television personalities Anton Deck, and singers Lionel Richie and Katy Perry. Richie and Perry were there because they were set to headline the coronation concert the following night. Their presence wouldn't have been all that notable, except for the fact that Perry comically got lost on the way to her seat. In a now viral moment, Perry can be seen wandering along the rows of seats, desperately looking for her assigned spot. The hilarious moment was instantly shared millions of times on Twitter, with fans poking gentle fun at the songstress's predicament. Perry took it all in stride, later tweeting, Don't worry, guys, I found my seat. King Charles pulled up to Westminster Abbey in the Diamond Jubilee State Coach, an ornate black and gold carriage drawn by six horses, given to Queen Elizabeth II in 2012. That grand entrance was just a small indication of how opulent and extravagant the rest of the day was going to be. Stepping out of the carriage, Charles wore the robe of state, a long crimson cape lined with ermine fur over his military uniform. He also donned a crimson surcoat that had once been worn by his grandfather, King George VI, at his coronation in 1937. It wouldn't be the only time during the day that Charles would wear something a previous monarch had worn. Charles also wore the gold super tunica that had been made for King George V in 1911, the imperial mantle designed for King George IV in 1821, and the belt, coronation glove, and robe of estate that had also been designed for his grandfather, King George VI. In fact, none of the garments that were used in the official proceedings were new, an intentional move that caused quite a stir among royal commentators, who are used to monarchs commissioning elaborate new vestments. For the most part, the ceremony itself went off without a hitch. Much of the coronation was done as prescribed by the Liber Regalis, a 14th-century manuscript that details how the rite should be carried out. But there was some controversy nonetheless. For example, King Charles changed the way homage was paid to him during the proceedings. Typically, all of the country's princes would pay homage, swearing loyalty and allegiance to the new monarch. But only Prince William wound up doing so, stepping in on behalf of the entire royal family. I, William, Prince of Wales, pledge my loyalty to you 
and faith and truth I will bear unto you. Instead of running a full homage of peers, Charles replaced it with homage of the people, inviting ordinary citizens to swear their fealty to him. This would have been the first time in history that Britain's people were asked to do something like this, and the request didn't go over well. In the lead-up to the big day, the palace changed the homage to an invitation rather than a requirement in response to the criticism. After the homages were paid, the oath was taken and the king was anointed. The proceedings wrapped up with King Charles being physically crowned with the five-pound 17th century St. Edward's crown. Once King Charles was officially crowned, it was Queen Camilla's turn. And yes, it's Queen Camilla, not Queen Consort Camilla. Given the dramatic nature of the start of King Charles and Queen Camilla's relationship, it's always been unclear what she'd be called when he eventually assumed the throne. When the pair tied the knot back in 2005, Camilla agreed to be called the Princess Consort when Charles was crowned. This was in accordance with the precedent established by Queen Elizabeth's husband, Prince Philip, who was the Prince Consort rather than the King Consort. Then, Queen Elizabeth had a change of heart and decided Camilla could be Queen Consort. But once Charles was on the throne, he was free to change his wife's official title to Queen, should he wish. So when invitations for the coronation went out in April 2023, Camilla's title transitioned from Queen Consort to simply Queen. King Charles acknowledged the change, saying that while he was deeply conscious of his mother's wishes, simplifying the title would just make things easier. Camilla's coronation ceremony was much simpler than Charles's. There was no legal oath required of her, nor was there any need to pay homage. Still, it concluded in nearly as dramatic a fashion as her husband's, with her being crowned with an upcycled version of Queen Mary's crown. Given the significance of the day, you might assume that all of the attention would have been on King Charles and Camilla as they fully stepped into their new roles. But Charles' five-year-old grandson, Prince Louis, was the real star of the show, stealing the spotlight from the monarch on more than one occasion over the course of the day. In the run-up to the ceremony, many wondered if Louis would actually attend the coronation. There was some concern that the long, solemn event would be too much for the rambunctious kindergartner, who has a history of acting up during official appearances. Page Six even reported that the palace had a plan in place to pull him out of the church mid-ceremony if his behavior became an issue. Indeed, it appeared that Louis decided to take a break about halfway through. But for the most part, he sat alongside his parents, Prince William and Princess Catherine, and older sister, Princess Charlotte, for the entire thing. Even so, there were plenty of shenanigans from the young prince. At various points, he was spotted yawning, dancing, pointing things out to his seatmates, and making faces at the crowd. In fact, he was so animated that it appeared to have exhausted poor Charlotte. Prince William told Hello Magazine the next day, "'She's very tired after yesterday. It was making sure her little brother behaved herself.'" According to the BBC, the coronation was estimated to cost up to $125 million. This would easily make it the most expensive coronation of all time. The events were funded by UK taxpayers' money, although the palace did contribute an undisclosed sum. This didn't sit right with many people, given the country's current economic struggles. We do not need a coronation. You know, the Swedish king decided the coronations were out of date, and that was in, like, 1870. One woman perfectly summed up the nation's general feeling when she told the BBC, "'We're struggling for heating and eating, and they're splashing all this money out. It's a lot of money to pay out, and I think, in this day and age, they need to do it on a low budget.'" That said, plenty of others viewed the expense as a necessary evil, thinking that a bigger event would ensure more people would travel to London to witness it in person. This, of course, could mean huge profits for the hospitality and tourism industries, which are still struggling to recover from the continuing impact of COVID-19 and Brexit. While it remains to be seen how the coronation affects the UK economy, it's safe to say that the day was a massive success on TV. More than 18 million people in Britain alone tuned in to watch the proceedings, and Britain once again has a full-fledged monarch.